Welcome, Ignatian family. My name is Chris Kerr, Executive Director of the Ignatian Solidarity Network. Welcome to this Ignatian family virtual teaching on migration. As you may know, the Ignatian Network has been gathering for more than 20 years each November in Washington, D.C. to commemorate the lives of the six Jesuits and two lay women killed at the University of Central America in San Salvador, El Salvador in 1989. For our network, this was a pivotal event that galvanized public action to respond to the realities of injustice and the abuse of human rights perpetuated by the government of the United States. Our November Ignatian Family Teach-In for Justice has been a space to reflect on the legacy of these martyrs while learning, praying about, and taking action on the contemporary issues of injustice facing society today. But it is not November, and you, at least most of you, are not in Washington, D.C. Today, our Ignatian family is gathered virtually, but with the same purpose. We are hopeful that this virtual teaching can be a space for learning, reflection, prayer, and networking, focused on the realities that many people in our world face who migrate. The number of people globally living outside their country of birth has been growing substantially over the last 20 years, from 173 million in 2000 to 258 million in 2017. 68.5 million people who have been displaced from their homes, 40 million who are internally displaced, 25.4 million refugees, and more than 3 million asylum seekers. Here in the U.S., more than 43.7 million immigrants reside in our country. An estimated 10.7 million of these people live in the shadows of our society without documentation while contributing to our communities in a variety of ways. In short, the reality of migration is a significant part of the reality of the world today. We stand as a community of unique individuals compelled to take action on migration issues. Our ne network includes those who have migrated themselves, those unsure about where they stand on migration issues, and those who identify as allies and as advocates. We relate to and address these issues in many ways, as family members, classmates, friends, fellow parishioners, colleagues, neighbors, community members, and from personal experience. Our common foundation is that we are people of faith. We are committed to standing with all those who are vulnerable, to more deeply understand the stories of our neighbors, to prayerfully, prayerfully reflect upon what our faith traditions teach us, and to respond in ways that build a world that is more loving, compassionate, and just. By being part of this virtual teaching, you have joined over a thousand people from more than 35 states across the U.S., as well as viewers in Canada, Australia, Chile, Germany, Ireland, uh, and the, the Philippines, as well as Mexico, who are watching live or plan to watch at a future date. I wanted to give a special Ignatian family shout out to those groups that are joining us live today. St. Louis University High School in St. Louis, Missouri. Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. St. Ignatius Parish, St. Ignatius College Prep and the University of San Francisco in San Francisco. Holy Trinity Parish in Washington, D.C. The Ignatian Associates uh, Chicago community in Wilmette, Illinois. The College of St. Mary in Omaha, Nebraska. Manhattan College in Bronx, New York, the Church of St. Ignatius of Loyola in New York City, Canisius College in Buffalo, New York, St. Joseph Academy in Cleveland, Ohio, St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the Brothers of the Christian Schools in Providence, Rhode Island, St. Maximilian Colby Secular Franciscan Fraternity in Houston, Texas, and St. Joseph Parish in Seattle, Washington. For those who gathered, gathered in these groups, you have already begun with our opening prayer, an Ignatian Examen on Migration. For those just joining us, please know that this resource is available to you today and in the future. With the Examen as our grounding today, we will have the opportunity to hear from a number of members of our Ignatian Network who will invite us to learn about their own lives and those they walk with. Our first speaker is Aitana Libreros. Aitana is currently a lay pastoral associate at St. Aidan's, the St. Peter's University Church, and is also completing a Master's of Science program in church management at Villanova University. A recent St. Peter's University graduate, Aitana continues to build on her immigration advocacy work during her college 
uh, career uh, by working with the migrant community in Jersey City through the new St. Aidan's Migrant Center, an independent interfaith project that aims to empower immigrants through education, skills development, resource access, and capacity building. She grew up in Hudson County, New Jersey, and is the daughter of parents who are undocumented. Welcome, Aitana. My name is Aitana Libreros, uh, and I am the lay pastoral assistant here at St. Aidan's, the St. Peter's University Church. Uh, I'm also a recent graduate of St. Peter's University with a degree in political science, um, and I'm now in a new capacity here at the parish. Um, so uh, I am also the daughter of two undocumented migrants. Uh, my mom is from Mexico and my father's from Colombia. And I grew up in West New York, uh, here in New Jersey, which is not far from Jersey City, um, where there is a large community and population of undocumented migrants. Um, and so I grew up in a space where I wasn't the only one um, with those circumstances. Um, I first found out about my parents' status when I was five years old. There was a news of a raid that happened near us, and so being the oldest of two children, uh, my parents were really concerned and decided to tell me uh, about their situation. And so since then, I've known and lived in a lot of fear of um, coming home one day from school and them not being there. Um, and a lot of my classmates and friends had similar fears as well. And so as I got older, I really wanted to get involved and do something, um, but was very fearful of, um, you know, ousting my parents due to their status. Uh, it's very easy to get involved with something when it just affects yourself, but when it affects your whole family, um, it, it makes you doubt what you can do. And so I first wanted to become involved to educate myself more on what steps I can take to protect my parents or even start petitioning for them. And so when I got to college, um, you know, I met a group of people who were very active in the community. Uh, and here at St. Peter's, we have the Center for Undocumented Students. And so I was able to learn. Um, I was able to find a network of people who understood what I felt and validated um, sort of my life experience. Uh, and now that I'm here at St. Aidan's, uh, we've recently opened uh, the St. Aidan's Migrant Center back in July of 2017, um, which is a space in which we offer services, we offer educational programming um, to our migrant brothers and sisters here in the community. Um, so far, we've done Know Your Rights training, we've done financial literacy courses, we've done some uh, self-care in terms of like breast cancer um, and legal consultations, uh, also like English conversation courses. Uh, and so little by little, we've been offering um, programming that helps them feel more secure and safe and allow them to start any processes that they maybe can begin. Um, we've also done educational programming around, for example, Archbishop Romero and his canonization. Um, we've done programming between here and the university, um, which has been really helpful to combine our communities and involve other community organizations. Um, we also have, you know, this, this all came from the community in the parish seeing a need. Um, our parish is full of different migrants from everywhere. We have a huge Filipino population. We have a huge Hispanic population. Uh, and so within our community, there was a need. And that need um, was for this migrant center. Um, so I think that if you don't know what to do, um, my first suggestion would be to educate yourself. Whether or not you're uh, undocumented or have a family member who's undocumented or you're just someone who's interested, I think it's important to educate yourself in migrant rights. Uh, right now we're seeing that migrants are being stopped at a higher rate uh, by immigration officials, whether on the street or at checkpoints. Uh, or at their houses and so educating ourselves on what rights migrants have in those situations is very important uh, and spreading that information since migrants aren't aware of what rights they have um, and also educating ourselves on how to prepare families uh, for these situations that's something that we deem very important here um, a great resource is a uh, 
informedimmigrant.com. Um, they offer uh, paperwork in various languages on rights for migrants and on um, family preparedness plans. Um, you know, ch children being separated from their parents doesn't just happen at the border. Uh, it happens when parents are also detained by immigration and oftentimes children aren't accounted for in those processes and may be left unattended. And so if a family has a plan in place for what will happen to those children for them to be taken care of, it's very important and will help the child not only feel safe, but it will help the parents process uh, with any immigration proceedings. Uh, so it's very important to to teach our community about, about what to do in the circumstances. Thank you, Aitana. And now we move from the East Coast to the West Coast and welcome Marissa Montes, the co-director of the Los Angeles Immigrant Justice Clinic, a community-based collaboration of Loyola Law School at Loyola Marymount University, as well as Homeboy Industries and Dolores Mission Church. The clinic has a dual mission uh, to advance the rights of the indigent immigrant population in East Los Angeles through direct legal services, education, and community empowerment while teaching law students effective immigrants rights lawyering skills in, the, in a real world setting. Upon graduating from Loyola Law School in 2012, Marissa was jointly awarded Loyola's Postgraduate Public Interest Fellowship and co-founded this unique community-based clinic, which brought direct immigration legal services through clinical legal education to the east side of Los Angeles. Through this fellowship, Marissa gave her first law lecture at the age of 25 and has since successfully supervised many clinical law students in their representation of immigrant clients. In addition to her role in the clinic, Marissa has also taught courses on cross-cultural competency and trauma as they relate to legal representation and spearheaded Loyola Law School's first alternative spring break trip to El Paso, Texas where students represented immigrants in removal proceedings. Marissa has also testified before the California State Assembly and appeared in major news outlets, including the Los Angeles Times and CNN Espanol. Welcome, Marissa. These last two years have been some of the most trying for me, both personally and professionally, ones that have even called into question my ability to commit to immigrant rights advocacy for the long run. But even during the darkest of times, and when it feels like moments of definite defeat, I force myself to reflect on how God and life brought me to do this work. My passion for teaching and immigrant rights work is more than just related to my personal story. It was truly born out of my love for my community and for those who greeted me and my family with open arms and loving hearts during our darkest points. You see, my story is not much different from those I encounter every day at work. My parents left Mexico when I was a child seeking what many others do, safety and the dreams of a better life, if not for themselves, then at least for their daughter. But arriving to the United States was no easy feat. Adjusting to a new country was hard, and being accepted proved to be even more difficult. Months after arriving, my parents and I experienced homelessness. With nowhere to go, my father reached out to one of his only friends, Khan and his wife Yasmin, a couple who just recently immigrated from Cambodia along with their children, Sima, Jihad, and Mukta. Without hesitation, Khan and Yasmin welcomed us into their home, offering us shelter until my parents were able to get on their feet. Though we were two distinct families from two different parts of the world with only some English language in common, we were journeying together in a new country we both desired to call home. Life continued and continue to throw curveballs at my family. But every time we hit a low, a hand would come to offer support. When we experienced hunger, Pastor Zach and his parishioners would share a meal with us. When I struggled to learn English and fell behind in school, it was my tia Anne who tutored me. When my father fell gravely ill, it was the Garcia family who would look after me and him so my mother could go to work. The list continues of family, friends, teachers, and acquaintances all of whom who helped us carry a load and made life seem possible. Our friends may have believed their impact to be minimal, but it made all the difference in the world to me. It was this compassion, love, and lack of judgment shown to me that I wished to embody and pay forward to other people. My desire to become an immigrant rights attorney is not born solely out of my own experience, but in honor of those who came before me 
and to those who journeyed with me throughout my child, childhood and young adulthood. An act of gratitude and love that I seek to pay forward to individuals that I serve, and a trait that I seek to pass on to my students every day by example. Even now, as a lawyer, being mindful of this point proves to be difficult, and I can only try my best to daily honor those who once supported me. But every now and then, an interaction occurs that takes me out of my head of legalese and reminds me that the purpose of this work is to journey with others, not just to succeed on a legal claim, a point that I was reminded by when meeting my client, Esmeralda. I first met Esmeralda when she was 16 years old a junior in high school who dreamt of going to college. Esmeralda was a dreamer, brought to the United States as a child, and came to me in hopes of obtaining DACA. Esmeralda presented well, eloquent, nicely dressed, a, a straight-A student, initially er introverted, but was one who very much reminded me of myself. But as I continued to get to know her, I realized there was much more to this young girl's story that included resilience and survival. At 16, Esmeralda experienced more hardship than most adults would ever do in their lifetime. She was a girl who had entered the United States by herself at the age of five, and who raised herself with the support of her maternal grandmother and step-grandfather. A story of sadness and courage, but one that she was able to reclaim as her own to access legal permanent residency. Throughout the course of representation with my students at the time, I helped Esmeralda gain her voice and make sense of a legal system that could only be daunting for a high school student. We listened as she shared, shared her story for the very first time, thanked her for her trust, and reassured her that despite the difficulty, sharing her story would ultimately provide her not only a pathway to legalization in the States, but ease her stress and her ability to attend college. I truly took under, Esmeralda under my wing, shared with her my story, and assisted her with whatever possible. By the end, Esmeralda secured her residency and shared that due to this experience, she too knew she wanted to become an immigration attorney. That summer, Esmeralda asked if she could be an intern for me at the clinic. I agreed, even though we both knew this meant she would spend hours filing papers and organizing our supply cabinet. By then, I had retained a new client, Veronica, a survivor who endured a decade of, tra a decade of trafficking and had recently gathered the courage to come forward to file her claim. Veronica was coming in for a meeting and Esmeralda begged to be present. I hesitated to allow her to join me, mostly due to Esmeralda's young age and my fear that Veronica would become uncomfortable. Esmeralda did not waver on her request, so I sheepishly asked Veronica if my 16-year-old high school student could be present. Though I sensed hesitation, Veronica agreed, stating that she believed it would be a good learning experience for any student. As we sat down to start the meeting, Esmeralda asked me if she could introduce herself to Veronica. I nodded and told her to go ahead. To my surprise, Esmeralda did not just introduce herself, but told Veronica her story, about how she just got her residency, how she entered the United States alone at the age of five, and how she raised herself as a child in a new country. Esmeralda further explained that though she was uh, not aware of Veronica's story, she understood the fear of being undocumented and the fear of coming forward, and that she hoped that her presence was not intrusive as, if it, was, as it was meant to be supportive. At the moment, a young girl and a woman old enough to be her mother, with two distinct stories but one common experience, began to journey together in Veronica's quest to call the United States her home. Veronica, with tears in her eyes, thanked Esmeralda for her kind words and assured her that she did in fact feel much better knowing she was in the presence of someone who had held her same understanding. At that moment, I realized that I had not only fulfilled my purpose of honoring those who journeyed with me, but that Esmeralda now too sought to pay it forward. I'm also happy to report that Veronica has secured legal status and now she too seeks to support others in her similar shoes. And it's such moments that I continue to search for and use as indicators of success, even in the most trying of times. Because if there's anything I have learned is that in moments of darkness, compassion has the power to renew light. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marissa, for your stories and insights into your work at Loyola Law School. 
we now like to take you to the U.S.-Mexico border and Nogales, Sonora, where the Kino Border Initiative is located. During a recent visit to Kino, I was able to speak with Enrique, an immigrant from Mexico, Mexico who came to the U.S. as a teenager. Enrique has spent the majority of his life in the U.S., working and raising a family. Like many others in communities throughout the United States, Enrique's life has been severely impacted by our country's current immigration enforcement policies. I'm personally grateful to Enrique for being willing to share his story with me, and now you, and to our partners at the Kino Border Initiative for their ongoing presence and support of those who face deportation, as well as those who seek to come to the United States. Okay, lo tenía 30 años, bueno, sí, 30 años viviendo en Estados Unidos. Este, tengo cuatro hijas de familia. Yo soy divorciado, me divorcié, me casé y me divorcié en Washington. Y este, tenía ya mi propio negocio. Ya trabajaba por los últimos ocho años por mi cuenta. Y a, a una parada de, de, de tránsito y en, en lo que estuvo legal con mi expareja, este, llegó a esa, a una corte donde estaba sobre el divorcio y ahí me detuvo a eso. Estuve a cuatro meses peleando mi, mi caso y me dieron, no me dieron fianza, no me dieron nada, porque no, no me había pedido nadie anteriormente. Uh, no, nunca tuve familiares que tuviera uh, para poder aplicar. Y a los abogados que veía yo me decían que por tiempo no podía arreglar documentación, solamente que alguien me pidiera. Y, este, y lo único es de que, como yo estuve muchos años en... En Washington. Sí sé hablar inglés, pero no muy perfecto. Este, uh, vengo aquí a México deportado y tampoco estoy registrado en México. Entonces todos los papeles, todo tuve que sacar acta de nacimiento y todo. Cuando lo saqué, ahora que volví a tratar otra vez de entrar, me castigaron por tres meses más. Ahora vuelvo a salir otra vez aquí deportado por Nogales. Y, y tengo que volver a recuperar todo porque la documentación no me regresaron nada, no celular, no papeles, no nada. Y es difícil para mí en forma de que, um, como tengo 44 años de edad, aquí en México ya no dan trabajo uh, fácil uh, con mi experiencia, no, dan, no me dan trabajo en una empresa o una compañía porque ya me hicieron el test de inglés y todo, y sí lo paso, pero por mi edad no me dan trabajo. Entonces es más difícil conseguir trabajo y es más difícil uh, volver a sacar toda la documentación otra vez. Y, este, y ahorita donde yo vivo soy de Michoacán, México, centro de México. Hay mucho um, mafia, delincuencia, y no dejan... Uh, como uno es nuevo, lo conocen a uno y... Uh, la Jesús mafia no, no es, deja, para llamada. Uh, no lo deja en paz a uno, Jesús no es. sabe que uno tiene familiares en Estados Unidos, piensa para, que para uno tiene llamada, dinero, que dinero y tratan de extorsionar a uno, entonces uh, ahorita tengo decidido quedarme aquí en la frontera y también ver cómo me va, cómo me va a ir, y esa es la única, esa es la única mala experiencia, pero la buena experiencia es que pues uh, Estados Unidos me brindó muchos años, no tuve problemas de... Um, legales en forma de que les de delincuencia no tuve nada de eso lo único es ahorita mis hijas son cuatro mujeres la más chica tiene 11 años ya, y la mayor va tiene 20 años y ellas ahorita están con su mamá y yo pues acá estoy batallando y tratando de ver si puedo otra vez pasar pero mi hija me dijo que iba este el proceso de cuando tenga 21 años pero no sé qué pueda pasar pues mucho porque aunque tengo comunicación con ellas por teléfono no es lo mismo ya, éramos muy pues, cuando de mi divorcio ya, yo tenía la custodia de ellas y ahorita pues la perdí porque volvieron con su mamá yo había tenido la custodia de ellas ahora volvieron con su mamá entonces no sé cómo les está yendo y, y ella me prohibió a través de un juez me prohibió a tener contacto con las más chicas. O sea, también es otro conflicto. 
¿verdad? Y um, como el estado de Washington es muy... Um, no, es, no es por hablar mal de, de la mujer, ¿verdad? Pero es más... Sea, 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 el estado de Washington es más como a la mujer. Entonces le dieron el derecho, como yo estaba deportado, quitarme, ponerme como un restrictor, así, orden de restricción. Um, y ya no puedo yo comunicarme con las más chicas, solo con las más grandes. Las que tiene 20 años y las de mayor, la de 17. Solo con ellas puedo comunicarme. Entonces, pero ellas son las que me dicen que están bien las niñas, pero yo sé que les afecta. Como la más grande, um, con, con mi trabajo, yo le ayudaba a la, al colegio, pero ella tiene mucho um, becas le ayudaban también con las becas, pero yo, yo era el que proveía todo. Tuve que vender mi uh, um, Double White, que tenía una traela, Double White. La tuve que vender para que ella uh, quedara con dinero. Entonces, ahorita a ver cómo me va aquí. Eso es lo único. ¿Eso? ¿Quieres decir otra cosa o quieres...? Dime, espero. No hay Era lo que no quería. Sí, es lo difícil nada más. Aquí pues está bien, estoy batallando un poco, pero... Um, lo bueno es que sé trabajar y, y a ver qué pasa si salgo adelante. Yeah. No más. Es lo que puedo compartir con ustedes. Thank you, Enrique, for sharing your story with us. We will now break for a reflection period. If you have not already done so, reflection questions for groups and individuals can be downloaded at the Virtual Teaching website. The URL is igsol.net/virtual.